Our next speaker is Ben Hilburn. Um, ben is the technology strategy lead for Azure Space and Spectrum at Microsoft. Ben is a former uh, head of engineering at Edis Research and director of engineering at DeepSig, as well as former president of the GNU Radio Project um, and founding member of the Open Research Institute. And I'm delighted to welcome Ben to present today. Yeah, thanks so much, Paul. Okay. Is this a okay distance? It sounds like it is. So uh, I'm super excited to talk today and I kind of figured I would use the pulpit of a, of a keynote to get on a soapbox a little bit. Uh, so there's really kind of two major things I want to talk about. And the first is this idea of ubiquitous computing, which is, um, I, it's not just a Microsoft thing. It's a thing that Microsoft cares a lot about, but I think we're finally at the point where it's real. And I want to, I want to talk about that for a second, but I also want to talk about why it's real now and how we can make it real uh, and the key roles of open source and open standards within that. And a, a major part of this is I'm we'll talk about how open source and open standards are used and how they can be misused and why it can go wrong. So just to start out, and uh, I, I missed the earlier keynote, so perhaps this was covered, but I wanna disambiguate these two things. So an open standard is something that's publicly accessible, usually, not always, usually developed in some collaborative process, right? And it has a license that allows anyone to use it, full stop, right? Uh, look at IEEE standards, right? Uh, look at USB, right? Uh, the standard for a Gerber file, right? Which is how PCB boards are designed. You can use those standards. Sometimes you have to pay for access to them. You cannot modify them. The Whoever owns the copyright owns the copyright and gives you no right to do anything with that standard beyond using it. You can't modify it. You can't derive from it. You can't create a new version of it, right? And you certainly can't redistribute it, especially for profit. Open source is entirely different. Open source, uh, and there's many forms of open source, right? Usually we're talking about open source software. There's also open source hardware. There's open source data, right? There's also open source standards. So open source fundamentally means it's something that can only be freely accessed, but that you can inspect it, modify it, use it, derive from it, redistribute it, at will, right? Uh, and the, the key thing I wanna point out here is something being open source, capital O, capital S, that's a term of art. Open source has a definition. There are nine hard rules for what makes something open source. The definition is maintained by the open source initiative. Uh, the same does not exist for an open standard. Anything can call itself an open standard, right? And very commonly, uh, I'll argue, organizations, quote unquote, open wash the things that they're doing to say, we have an open platform. Anybody can, can come build on our platform. We have an open standard. Anybody can build our standard, right? Uh, that's almost never as true as it sounds. But open source is, in my opinion, the very best tool that exists today for collaboratively solving engineering problems, especially those that sit across competing interests, right? In the same way that the scientific method is the very best tool that we have today to do science, open source, where they're talking about software, data, hardware, whatever, is the very best tool we have today for collaboratively solving technical challenges. And it is a tool of both business and engineering. There is no path to success to the success of open source anything that is not aligned with business objectives. So I wanna, I wanna talk more about that in this talk. But now that I've disambiguated these two things, I wanna shift context real quickly and talk about ubiquitous computing. So uh, I don't wanna sort of dive into the grand world of why ubiquitous computing is real. I'm gonna sort of assume everybody in the audience here is already on board with it. Um, Everybody should have access com to compute, right? Uh, access to compute and connectivity is 
a fundamental part of economic growth and success. Uh, right in the, in the US, there's a huge conversation over the digital divide and making sure that everybody has access to connectivity and the internet and compute more generally. So uh, this is a big deal for Microsoft. Uh, it's also a big deal for a lot of other large tech companies and, and, and service provider companies. Oops. So as an example, right, this is from an interview with the CEO of Verizon Business with Forbes, effectively saying, I, based on the subscription, right, this sounds like a human right, right? Uh, she's, she's describing connectivity as uh, on the same level as air and water, right? This one, um, Chris Westerpol, he's he was one of the, for anyone who's into, um, anybody recognize this name out of curiosity? He's one of the founders of Loft, the original hacking, uh, hacking group out of Boston. Uh, that then testified to Congress and those sorts of things. He's not the CTO of Aircode. Uh, his, in this interview, he was talking about ubiquitous connectivity from the perspective that now everything is connected, so everything is an attack surface, right? Which is true. But his point is, if you're thinking about cybersecurity, you do have to assume everything is connected because it's it's true. Uh, one more. This is from the. UN's Office of the Secretary General for uh, Technical Tech Innovation, I believe is the name of the office, but they have, a, they have a published plan to achieve what they call universal connectivity, uh, arguably the same thing as what I'm talking about here, by 2030, right? And again, kind of along the same lines of, hey, it's a human right. Uh, in the commercial world, you know, we're sort of assuming ubiquitous connectivity is here or is going to be here, right? These are IoT figures, or uh, massive IoT figures, right? We have 15, over 15 uh, a billion connected devices today. It's gonna grow to nearly 30 by 2030. Uh, the DOD has been trying to make ubiquitous computing real for decades. Um, you know, there's only so many lightning bolts you can throw on a chart before you just say, you know, everything needs to be able to talk to everything else, right? Uh, and for a long time, we kind of got this all wrong. So this, the next three slides are actually slides that I took from uh, my executive vice president's uh, keynote at Mobile World Congress earlier this year. And the message of this was, okay, you know, 20-ish years ago, uh, AWS did it first, obviously, but we started building out hyperscale clouds. Right, with the idea of, look, we're gonna commoditize compute and make it possible for anyone to use compute for anything. And so we're gonna build these huge data centers, lay uh, uh, massive global fiber networks, which to this, to this day are still mostly dark, right? There's massive global fiber that's unused, but it's not sitting on the internet. It's sitting within networks like Google's and AWS's and Microsoft's, right? And Oracle and all the others. And we, so everyone invested in building these huge compute resources, which were great for things like web services. But unless it's user generated data from interacting with the service, the data is not in the cloud, right? The data is out at the edge. And so all of the big web companies said, okay, we gotta, we gotta pivot the strategy a little bit, right? So then we started, everyone started talking about the intelligent cloud, right? And so this was, it's not just giant hyperscale data centers. It is the connectivity that surrounds it, right? Software-defined networking. Uh, we're gonna have the ability to reach the cloud, not just through fiber, which is how most of the clouds were built. It was assumed, it was assumed that all of the data that you might want to touch was, was within reach of fiber. And everyone realized, oh, wait, no, that's not quite true, right? Uh, a lot of the data sits at the end of wireless connections, in particular, cellular connections. Uh, but also, increasingly, SATCOM. And there is no world where ubiquitous connectivity and thus ubiquitous access to compute is possible without SATCOM. It just, it, it cannot happen. You have, you have to have the level of coverage that comes with SATCOM. And so this is where we come to today, where we have a, 
it's finally possible, and I'm going to step through this in a little bit more detail, to create what is actually ubiquitous connectivity. It's a combination of fiber, cellular, SATCOM, and other more bespoke modes of communication. But critically, one of the things that we have to change as part of this is the idea that every form of this communication is separate from the other, right? That every type of communication is siloed. And me as a user, I am paying for, I'm paying for a cellular plan. I'm running my home Wi-Fi network, right? I have an identity on Virginia Tech's network that I can use, right? Uh, maybe I'm paying for Starlink, right? And if I'm not paying for Starlink and it's something more traditional SATCOM, something like more traditional SATCOM, in order for me to use that SATCOM, I have to tell them months in advance where I want a beam. Like you have to, like a cruise, this is what cruise, cruise ships do. And when they buy, they all buy SATCOM, they say, hey, my ship is gonna be at this point in space time. I need a beam there two months from now, right? Uh, we have to, if for ubiquitous connectivity to be true, we have to move away from those principles and make it such that it actually is just a mesh of connectivity that you're able to move seamlessly between. So I'm gonna put a pin in that for one second, come back to open source real quickly, and then I wanna tie this together. So open source is already ubiquitous. Uh, these figures are from uh, two open source reports. One is from Perforce and one is from Synopsys. Synopsys, if you don't follow open source closely, Synopsys runs one of the broadest surveys of open source across the Fortune 500 industries. Um, so 80% of large companies say they've increased usage, which is fine, not surprising. More interesting, I think, is that 78% of code in Fortune 500 code bases was open source. So what is, what can you take away from that? The answer is only really 20-ish percent of what those massive companies are doing is actually differentiated. Everything else is common infrastructure, right? Where they bring value is in the last 20% of the thing that they are building, of the service that they're delivering, right? Everything else that they're relying on, everything else that they're building on is not uh, a core competency of theirs. And it's not where they add value to the product that they're selling. Finally, 96% of applications are leveraging open source. Right? That's, at that point, it, it truly is ubiquitous. So this one is from McKinsey and Company. Uh, and if there's anyone who has a history of being cynical about open source, it's McKinsey. Uh, right? So this came from a McKinsey uh, report in 2020 where looking at, I believe again, this was the Fortune 500. Uh, they determined that across all of the companies that they surveyed, there was a direct correlation between the amount of open source that was consumed by that company and the differentiation of that company in the market. Which makes sense, right? If you think about this, because the more open source they consume, the more time and resources they're investing in the part of their products and services where they add value, right? So that's not, not surprising. And so this McKinsey being McKinsey, you know, they come out with figures about how this makes you more innovative and that sort of thing. Um, I don't really know how you quantify innovation, but the fact that uh, uh, it was a uh, direct correlation in success. There was a direct tie between how much open source you consumed and how well you had captured your market, I think is fascinating. So let's pivot back to ubiquitous connectivity. Uh, I'll argue that ubiquitous connectivity is finally possible. And it's for these, it's because these four things are now true. So First, commodity scale. In order for us to reach this point, there has to be 
the, the open standards and networks, the systems that we're using, there has to be a commonality such that one standard or one group of standards applies at such a broad scale that building access to it is commodity. So here I'm talking about 5G, right? So we're reaching the point, especially with 5, 5G's design to enable uh, not just your cell phones, but also massive IoT, right? And other uh, modes of use. There will be so many devices that are connected to 5G that the cost of building access to 5G networks in any device will be driven down into the floor, right? And nobody is going to differentiate based on providing that access, right? Secondly, space convergence. As we talked about before, ubiquitous connectivity, not possible without the coverage of space, right? So now we're reaching, and so with 5G and through 5G non-terrestrial networking, it's now possible for our commodity scale for every device that has 5G access built into it to not just be talking to terrestrial networks, but to be talking to space networks, right? And that's critical. Otherwise, we'd have to go back to our siloed view of, oh, I do 5G, you know, when I'm within range of a tower, otherwise I'm switching to some different radio. I'm switching to some different network, some different provider. I'm paying on a different contract for access. Uh, we won't have to do that anymore. 5G NTN solves that problem for us. We already see the MNOs racing to create partnerships with space operators, right? Uh, Starlink and T-Mobile perhaps being the most well-publicized. There are several others where the MNOs who have plenty of spectrum, right? And a 5G subscriber base and the satellite operators who have satellites, but no spectrum and no 5G subscribers, right? Coming together to actually create a mesh network where devices can run between them. Unified security. So this is what we talked about before of having a concept of uh, you can move seamlessly through the network in a secure way. Uh, I think for anyone who's working on this, I think zero trust is a huge part of this. Um, and then finally, a unified programming model where uh, applications do not have to be bespoke written for the network that they are deployed on. So just to unpack that for a quick second, uh, if you think of FedEx, I'll use FedEx as an example, right? FedEx has thousands of locations across the United States and they run their business operations in a cloud. I actually don't know what cloud provider they use. They run their business operations in a cloud, right? Their network is probably written presuming the presence of fiber, right? Those service workloads that sit between their edge sites and the cloud assume the presence of fiber. If fiber goes away, right? And now they're communicating over a SATCOM link, more than likely a lot of FedEx locations have to shut down for the day, right? There's going to be failures because of presumptions made and how those services were written. Uh, again, here through, uh, software-defined networking. And you actually see uh, the major telcos today are now talking about programmable connectivity, right? It's sort of the thought leadership branding of this is I can program the network to deliver the connectivity I want. But ultimately what everyone's talking about is applications are driving the network. The network is not driving the users. All of these things, we're only at this point because of open standards and open source. None of these things would be possible without open standards and open source. And it's not just at the top level, right? 5G, 5G and TN is an open standard, sure. But all the way down to the PCB being manufactured, right? The Gerber file is an open standard, right? Uh, the ground stations, right? The tech stack of a ground station is, so for satellite ground stations, filled with open standards and open source. Security is almost, the only, the only things that are not open source and security at this point are the uh, specialized uh, analytics and tooling, AI watchdogs, and those sorts of things. Nobody's trying to write their own SSH implementation, right? Nobody's 
Nobody's trying to outdo the NSA on encryption, right? That's all open source. And same with the programming models, right? And actually, uh, the, progr the programming model is really interesting because it's an area where open source has been weaponized to completely conquer the way software development is done. Uh, I mentioned before that open source is a tool. One of the ways you can leverage that tool is to weaponize it against other companies. And there are several examples of companies completely disrupting an application space with an open source development toolkit, right? And taking over something that hasn't been done before. All of this only exists because of open standards and open source. We're all standing on the shoulders of giants here, usually building on things that we don't even realize we're building on, right? But it's gotten us to the point where all together, we could actually finally make this real. It's a real, these technologies exist. And it's not just a technical problem, it's a business problem, it's an organizational problem, it's a people problem, right? Uh, but it's possible. We have the pieces. So let's then talk about what that looks like. Because again, open source is a tool and just because you're using a tool does not mean it's gonna work. So this is my view, for example, of the 5G spec. So I think of open source as calling it a multi-sided market is sort of misusing an economic term. It's, it's more like uh, multi-sided stakeholders. So we have the, five, the 5G spec produced by, by the way, pedanticism. 3GPP produces specifications, not standards. The specifications are then standardized by nation state standard bodies. Um, the United States, for example, you might be familiar with ANSI is a standard body. Uh, 3GPP produces the 5G specification. Why does everybody participate in the 5G spec? Right. For, Verizon could walk away from that table. They did before, right? I remember when Verizon did their whole CDMA thing and they were like, guess what? We're gonna do our own thing, right? And they did for an entire generation. They changed their tune, next generation, right? Uh, why, 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 why do the operators all work on this together? Right? Why do Ericsson and Nokia, and Huawei, to some degree, work on this together? Governments, what consumer devices? Right? Why do Apple and Samsung and all the others do all of this together? Right? And it's because in order for each of their businesses to succeed, they have to solve the same problem in the same way as everyone else in this ecosystem or they will fundamentally limit their business success or they will fail. So let's unpack it further. Let's look at the operators. So it's especially interesting here is within the operator box where we have Verizon and AT&T and T-Mobile, right? They're all competing with each other, right? Verizon would love to eat enough of T-Mobile's lunch that they drive them into the ground, right? And I don't mean that in a mean way, I just mean Verizon wants some more customers, right? As fiercely as they compete, Verizon needs T-Mobile to work to do the same 5G that they are, right? Because what, what if T-Mobile doesn't? What if T-Mobile and AT&T go off and do their own thing? Well, now they've fractured the rest of the ecosystem, right? There'll be some vendors and integrators who are working on whatever the other 5G is. There'll be security researchers hardening the other 5G. Right? And Verizon is not gonna benefit from any of it. All right, so even within one box where the players compete with each other, they need their competition to solve the problem with them in the same way. And what's more is they need everybody else in the ecosystem to do the same thing, right? Verizon is not building RANs. They need the vendors to do the same thing. Verizon is they need regulatory bodies to be thinking about how can they deploy 5G, right? They want uh, government arms like militaries 
to be able to use 5G in their 5G networks. They need the device manufacturers to be building to 5G, right? If any, if any one of these boxes did not solve the problem in a different way, it would weaken the ecosystem for everyone, All right? So I only made this one slide, but you could do the same thing, right? That roundabout arrow, everyone competing with each other in the same box, but they all need the same thing. And everyone needs everyone else doing the same thing applies across all of these, All right? And that's why it works. Fundamentally, you have to have this or it doesn't work, right? Because again, there is no path to open anything that is not aligned with business objectives. It does not work. And there are numerous examples of companies, government agencies, organizations, uh, thinking of open source as just this, this ethereal thing, right? Where I'm gonna write a bunch of code, throw it over the wall, I'll post it on GitHub, I'll come back a year later, there's maybe 2 million users, right? That's not how it works. And usually what ends up happening is the people who do that poison the idea of open source within the organization, right? It's not good for open source as a whole for people to think open source can apply to anything and it will always bring the values of open source that everybody wants, right? Faster time to market, lower total cost of ownership, better security, right? Uh, or commonly perhaps making the mistake that the community of users that you have within an open source project are your customers. That's almost never true. It's almost never true that if you are a for-profit company, or even if you're not, if you're a national lab or an FFRDC, right? And you've released something that's open source. Your community of users, are probably not your customers, right? Your customers don't have time, but they have money. Your community of users have time and no money, right? Very different things. And if you make the wrong assumption about where you're going to monetize and how it's aligned to your business, it's gonna look like a giant waste of time you're going to release something a year later, you're going to walk away from it and alienate the whatever users you ended up winning. So my elephant in the room here is the RAN. So I think a really common mistake, this is where I'm getting up on my, well, I've been on my soapbox the whole time. I'm building a taller soapbox now, right? Um, I think in the 5G dialogue that we see publicly, you constantly see discussion of a ORAN. Awesome, love ORAN. It solves, uh, ORAN is an example of using an open standard in a right way. Now, granted, I would argue, would have been great for the vendors not to have been dragged kicking and screaming by the operators into it, but now all the vendors say that they've been into open stuff the whole time. So like everybody's on the same page now. But what about the RAN itself? Now remember, we're not talking about open standards now. ORAN, open RAN is an open standard. Going back to my disambiguation at the first slide, open source is different, right? Open source is an artifact with an open source license that has a strict definition, not unlike the SRS RAN, right? And so I think a lot of times people see this, right? I'm like, oh, you know, the 3GPP spec, fantastic example of the success of open standards, right? We're, we're all a, a, a rising tide raises all ships, right? Look how great it is. Everyone does the same thing with ORAM. It's the same players. Like, look how great it is. And then people drop the RAN into it. They're like, wait, wait, wait. Open source is a failure. None of the vendors will ever adopt open source RAN, right? How come we don't see Verizon rolling out open source RANs? How come we don't see space companies building satellites for 5G and TN rolling out open source RANs? It's because you got the ecosystem wrong, right? You're using the wrong tool for the wrong job in the wrong way, right? Operators, operators aren't building RANs, they buy RANs, right? Again, don't confuse your users for your customers. Does Verizon care? what the code looks like in T-Mobile's RAN? Of course not. 
Verizon's not differentiating itself based on how good its root raised cosine filters are. They don't care, right? They have performance targets. They buy a thing that meets those. They don't care how you build it. And if they do care how you build it, it's because you probably messed something up before, right? So within one box, none of these people care what the other people are doing, right? The consumer devices, right? They, they, they don't, they, do you think, you think Apple cares or Samsung cares if someone's using an open source RAM? That doesn't impact their sales, right? Most of their customers don't even know what a RAN is, right? What about the coming coming down to the vendors, right? There's a fundamental mismatch in their business model. Perhaps this changes one day, perhaps not. Right now, what the vendors sell is hardware. And not just hardware, it's hardware that has to be co-designed. It's hardware, software co-design, right? And it has to be vertically integrated, not necessarily because that's how derive value, how they derive value, although it, it kind of is, but from a technical perspective, it has to be, right? They have all their own vendor relationships. They're designing all their own hardware chassis and PCB boards and picking their FPGAs and they have all their own, like, the way that Nokia solves a problem is gonna look different from a hardware architectural perspective than the way Ericsson solves it, right? And so from their perspective, trying to adopt an open source RAN today, given their business and engineering model, they're not gonna get any technical value out of it and it's a massive opportunity cost. Why, why do it, right? And the operators don't care what anybody else is doing. Right? Because again, they're buying it. Now, the integrators love it, right? Because something that's open source is much easier for them to customize and build against, right? The governments love it because it's auditable. They can understand it, right? They can hire integrators to customize it and do wacky stuff with it, right? And the researchers love it because there's nothing. There, there, again, there is no better tool for something like research. But uh, my point is, you just take the same ecosystem and swap in open source for an open standard, right? It's not going to work. And people look at it and they say, oh, there's no future for open source and 5G. And one, you're already wrong, because going back to my earlier slide, it's open source all the way down. Everyone's building with open source. You're just thinking about it in the wrong way. If you change the ecosystem, right? So let's swap out the operators. Let's make let's think about let's think about educators, right? Let's swap out the vendors, and let's think about vendors who are not building uh, common equipment to an open standard, but they're building bespoke implementations of something for custom cust for for specialized customers, right? And let's think about uh, Let's swap out the consumer devices for people being network tools. Now, this is not, there's probably other boxes. Um, there's probably better boxes than this, right? But this is an ecosystem that actually makes sense, right? Educators absolutely benefit from a university system all doing research using the same open source project, right? Bespoke providers want to be able to customize low-level implementations, apply it to new hardware architectures, right? They're getting paid on labor, probably. Um, and if they're not, you know, they're going to upcharge, they're going to upcharge the result of it. So open source is great for them. They need that, right? They don't, they, they don't want to go to Nokia and ask for Nokia source code to then customize for hardware that's not Nokia's. That's not going to work, right? Network tooling. Uh, the barrier to entry of designing, let's say, an AI network tool to monitor a 5G network, right, is much lower if you can stand up a whole a network of open source RANs and build against it, as opposed to paying $10 million for the same thing in Nokia equipment. You're going to get the same result, right? This is an ecosystem that works, or might. I, you know, you can change some boxes out. Point being, this is a misunderstanding of what the economics of that open source project are.
this one makes sense. And hope now my starry background makes sense. So just a star field. Um, this is true for every open source project, every successful open source project, right? Every open source project that has achieved success has done it because they understand their ecosystem, right? The risk v ecosystem is different than the Linux ecosystem. It's different than this SBOM ecosystem. It's different than Kubernetes, right? They all have different stakeholders. They all have different communities and they all have different customers. But the critical thing about all of these is that in each of these ecosystems, every player needs their competitors to solve the same problem in the same way. And they need everybody else in the ecosystem to solve the same problem in the same way. It's the only way it works. So I'm gonna finish shortly here. Uh, there's a famous quote from Mark Andreessen, who's a big Silicon Valley venture capitalist. Um, he said some terrible things, but he did say a thing that I agree with, which is a software is eating the world. Uh, open source is eating software. And the thing about software is the marginal cost of software is zero. It does not cost you more money to sell a piece of software to a million customers as it does one customer. Their marginal cost is zero, right? That means software is a force for commoditization. And open source accelerates that beyond belief. So this is the note I'd like to sort of leave, leave you with is um, I don't know if, you know, I, I, I don't know what the future ecosystem looks like for open source 5G RANs. Maybe the vendors come along, maybe they don't. Maybe they get disrupted, right? Because somebody does, does it better. But the point is the only reason that we've gotten to the point today where the cloud providers and the network providers and the, tele the terrestrial MNOs and the space network providers, right? The only reason that all of them are talking about, hey, we can finally make ubiquitous connectivity real. We can finally, finally provide access to everyone, right? It's because everything that everyone has built, everything that everyone has built is built on open source and is built on open standards. But you gotta use it in the right way or it's not gonna happen. And so I think we're at the point today where we have the components, right? We have, uh, the commodity scale. We have space terrestrial convergence. We've got the security. We've got the unified programming. We can pull them all together and we can make this real. But again, we have to use the right tool for the right job in the right way. Uh, otherwise, it's not going to work out. Everybody's going to leave the table mad at each other. Um, so, anyways, that was my soapbox. I ended early. If anybody has questions. Um. Thanks very much, Ben. Uh, so we have some time for questions. Oh, wait. Yeah, thanks for your uh, very, uh, so, uh, some of the deep thought. So um, I guess my question is about academia. You mentioned you know, the difference between customer and users. Yeah. Uh, for folks in academia, we don't have cash and mm -hmm. oftentimes we don't have time either. Yeah. So I guess the question, do, do you have any thought about, you know, anything that we can do better in academia potentially to contribute better to the open source and how? Absolutely. The way universities incentivize professors going up for tenure needs to change is my hard answer. Uh, I think, so here is my, um, Imagine I'm wearing a Microsoft hat. I take it off at this point. Um, I believe that the current tenure system disincentivizes academics who are building a career in academia to making meaningful impact leveraging open source. Um, and 
the way ten, it's rare for tenure packages to, or for tenure committees to, I think, value open source in the same way they value a journal publication, right? Despite the potential impact of the former over the latter. Uh, I think there's not an understanding within academia of open source processes, right? Everyone knows how to cite a paper, right? Every academic in this room probably knows what their H index is, right? How do we get to the same point with how many people have you enabled with your open source research? They're two different systems and they're working independently of each other, right? And I, don't, I think a lot of grad students that come through grad school don't understand open source. It's actually a major problem in the, in, in the industry right now, the industry, big tech, is uh, students come out of curriculums, depending on what they specialized in, right? Perhaps understanding theory, right? Understanding how to write scientific articles, how to write great MATLAB simulations. They don't understand an open source engineering process, which is how everything is built at this point. Even if something's not gonna be an open source project within large tech companies, it's called inner source. By the way, if you want to read about it, it's called InterSource. It's an open source development process, right? And um, so I think there's a real part. My first part, first answer to your first part of my answer to your question is, I think right now there's a um, disconnect between uh, how academia values the output of its people and the value that's produced by open source. Um, and I think until we start seeing that change, it's going to be really, really hard to push the needle in the other direction uh, because professors need tenure. They need grants. New professors want that NSF career grant, right? Um, the other thing I, and so the second part of what I would say is more to your specific question. Your, your point was academia, academia is different because Usually you don't have money and you also don't have time, right? And so your question was, uh, you know, what, what can we do to better to participate in open source? Am I parroting that back correctly? Yeah, here. Professor, I think it's really about students, I see in many ways, I think. That's major driving driving force of academia, I thought. I'm sorry, can you say that last part one more time? Uh, I'm saying, when I say, you know, academia, I think what's more important is actually how students, I think, how they can best con contribute. Because I, yeah. professors, you know, we end up just thinking, right? We don't have as much time to mm -hmm. really do things, unfortunately. But <laughs> maybe that, that needs to change. But just curious how you think, you know, if you have any. Yeah, absolutely. And so my, my, sh my short answer there is, since your grad students are not trying to get tenure, value their open source contributions as part of their thesis or dissertation. Like that's, that's every, in the same way that open source only works when it's aligned to your, to, to business objectives and in industry, right? It's fundamentally an incentive problem. I think the same is true in academia, right? Uh, and committees that value the documentation and, the ability for other people to understand the work that your grad student did and reproduce it using open source code or open source data, right? If that's a critical part of defenses, students are gonna care and they're gonna be motivated to learn. Now, you might have the problem that they don't have anybody there to necessarily teach them how to participate in open source communities. And there's plenty of examples of that. Uh, but I think, I think fundamentally it has to, the professors, and the committees have to value that as part of the degree, is my opinion. Uh, Josh. Uh, I liked your presentation. I, actually, there was a slide where it says who is interested, who is not. That's a pretty good ecosystem. Um, you just pointed out. Um, sorry, I couldn't be here on the panel. Uh, my apology to the whole audience. Uh, but I have a question um, about open source test bed, right? We have been talking about who are the um, who are the beneficiary, right? Who will get, and, and the, the, the dependency chart that you showed is pretty good. Um, so within IEEE, um, understanding the importance of open source, mm -hmm. uh, we are building a IEEE uh, 5G6 innovation testbed. Yeah. And the idea is to make sure people around the world, universities, academics, startups, uh, if they don't have access to a common shared platform, 
Um, they cannot do anything. I mean, I know there are islands of test bed, like power test bed we listen, the many universities have. Um, so with that in mind, um, to, be, to be able to give this facility to the rest of the world, yeah. uh, we are building this test bed. And many of the universities, they get access and the students are teaching 5G course, right? They get hands-on experience. Startups, they do not have access to their uh, test bed because they don't have enough funding. Yeah. Uh, they use this as a platform to collaborate with uh, vendors uh, and operators to come up with some proof of concept. So I wanted to hear uh, your comment of having something like this that could be useful to the humanity, right? I mean, grad students, faculty, startups, uh, you know, they can benefit a lot from this kind of things, right? Yeah, fully agree. And so the thing that I would say, so I completely agree with the thesis of your statement, which is we're going to build this thing. There's a lot of people that could benefit from it, right? I very, very strong agreement with that. The, I think the key question for, for you is of the things that you're going to produce that are open source, what are the things that are only going to work on your test bed? Right. Um, and to give a better example of what I mean by that, uh, if you're building radio applications or radio research with software that can only be used on your test bed, not because it's not open source, but because it's literally written in a way that's not portable, or the APIs don't make sense outside of your test bed, right? Uh, you're creating an artificial barrier to people outside of the immediate academic community, like startups, like Microsoft, right? To be able to invest into it. Because from my perspective, anything that I build against that looks like bespoke development, right? And so I would say fully on board with the thesis of your statement. And I think one way you could amplify it even further is by clearly identifying, look, these are the things that are being produced by this test bed that can be used outside of our test bed. And what ends up happening, and there's really great examples of this, what ends up happening with that is each of those create momentum in their own communities. And there's a natural gravity back into your test bed because your test bed is going to be the first and best platform for using that software, right? But, and reproducing research, but because it can be used outside of it, right? Now, when I build against it, it looks like something that, you know, my team can build with for one person, for one purpose within Microsoft, and I can then bring that to your test bed if it makes sense. But um, assuming I understood your question correctly, the statement of test bed, it makes total sense to me. Yeah. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Um, yeah, I, I happen to sit at the intersection of, of research and, and the business side of, of 5G and particularly open RAN. One of the things we're seeing is, and, and we're talking about these forces, these, this gravitational pull to more complex, you know, containerized microservices. Yep. Everything is getting smaller and, and disaggregated multi-vendor, which sounds great to academics and certain parts of your ecosystem. But there on the other side, there's the other, you know, group of folks that are looking at it saying, how do I monetize this? Right. So we keep reading about layoffs. We're reading about, you know, folks that can't figure out how to make IoT, you know, pay for itself. Yeah. There's so many killer apps that come and go and we're just, you know, we're wondering what does the future look like? Is there even going to be a 6G, right? So at some point, we, we know researchers aren't going to be caring about, is this going to be profitable to someone down the road? No one thinks about IP, you know, in terms of how does this get monetized later? But is there a point where we feel like there is a happy medium? When you mentioned that the don't care are arrows, is there a point where we can say there's a, a, a competitive tension, a friendly tension that can be established where we can all sort of work towards the common goals as opposed to working against each other in some ways, pulling us uh, out of our comfort zones, whether you're on the business side of the equation or on the research, uh, you know, developer side of the equation. Yeah. So is your, I want to restate your question to you just to make sure I understood it. Is your point that um, uh, it feels like what's getting built on the research side is at this point, so disaggregated and so split apart and so complex and specialized that nobody outside of that, for example, industry is going to come to the same table as you. Is that 
at a high level, kind of what you're talking about. Yeah. So uh, I fully agree with that. Yeah. I mean, I um, the more complex the architecture, no matter, regardless of whether it's open source or not, right? The more specialized the architecture, the least, the less likely it will be that anybody else will ever care. Um, certainly, with an industry where, when open source is adopted, right? One of the things we have to understand is uh, what is the what is the technical liability of it. I don't mean liability is like a security risk or legal risk or 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 whatever, but uh, what is what is the liability of taking a thing that was built for something that's not my system, right? And attempting to customize it for something else. This is like the Nokia Ericsson example we talked about before. Um, so I think I'm a little bit more optimistic than you in terms of like, will there be a 6G? Is there a path to the future and that sort of thing? I, I think one of the things that I struggle with is a lot of time, uh, I think the research community is not good, and I'll, I'll use the term carefully, but I'm gonna define it at product management. So an in industry product management is, for anyone who's not familiar, is a discipline, uh, by which you understand what a customer or your users need out of your product and how they want to interact with it. And I think very often in the research community, that's not something, and you could argue this is good or bad, uh, that's not something anybody ever really cares about, right? You have a goal that you're build, building towards, a theory that you want to prove or develop, right? Um, some kind of model that you've written in MATLAB and you need a framework that you can drop into it and, and show that your model, what, whatever it is, right? I think a lot of times the purpose of research might be to produce something that is verifiable by others. It's rarely to produce something that can be built on by others. And uh, I think, again, you could argue good or bad, uh, but I think if the goal is ever that, hey, we've got this great research community building incredible technology and we wanna make sure the things that we're building are not just theory that gets adopted into someone else's thing, but we're gonna produce something that again, lets somebody else stand on the shoulders of giants, including you, right? And incorporate it into a product. Um, you can't do it with, it's called inside out thinking, building a thing and, th and assuming that it's been built in a way that everyone else can use. It has to start with understanding who, who do you think your users are and how do they want to use your thing, right? Because that's gonna define like a technical level, like where your APIs are and that sort of thing. But at a broader level, are you even solving a problem in a way that they're gonna be able to care about, or that they are able to care about? Um, so that's how I think about that. I uh, broadly, I'll say, there's a lot of research that happens that I think probably sort of vanishes into the night without having much impact. And that's probably why. Okay, let's thank our speaker.